So with the unique aspect of secondary education right now, I wanted to give a little more information on accessibility and have us dig a little deeper into accessibility with our current state of learning being mostly remote, crisis schooling, online, all of those words. Um, so first, let's review what do we already know from being in the regular classroom. We know that accessibility includes time and a half for a lot of students, sometimes up to double time for students that are going to struggle with working problems um, on longer tests that maybe take longer to process. A lot of students have the processing issues, so sometimes word problems might take them longer to read and then process and interpret. Um, there's also frequent breaks, so that's another accommodation. We're pretty familiar with those in the brick and mortar classroom. Larger fonts, there's actually a lawsuit in the state of Louisiana right now against a school district that refused to provide worksheets in a larger font to a student with an IEP. Um, so we know that's a common accommodation. We should know that an IEP is a contract and it is legally binding. So we do have to abide by those things in the classroom. Um, you may have a screen reader or you may have a designated person in your school that's going to do read aloud testing. You might have oral testing as an accommodation where the student is giving you the answer and someone else is recording the answers. You might have to break assignments down into smaller pieces so they're digestible. And you also have to challenge students that are gifted. So when we're talking about accessibility and meeting the needs of all learners, we're not just talking about IEPs and 504s and the sense of struggling kids. We're also talking about what about those high level kids and what are you doing for them? So in the state of Louisiana, we have a lot of schools that are geared towards the gifted and the arts. So a lot of the time, some of the things we'll do is if we assign a class project, we may allow the gifted kid, if they're a gifted dancer, if they're a gifted musician, to do it in song or dance. And so maybe they're going to dance the transformations of the absolute value function. Um, we actually have a school that's fully dedicated to the arts, and they do a lot of projects like that. So we're familiar with these things. We know that if a group, if we're doing group work and you have a high level group, you may give them an extension question to work on while the rest of the groups are still working through your assignment. This is instinctual for us teachers because it's become instinct with managing our classroom. And the longer you've been in the classroom, the more comfortable you're going to get with on the fly modifications. However, right now, we don't have the ability to look at our classroom and see that, oh, this group is done early or this student is done early. We're all online. So I wanted to highlight some of the key things about online accessibility for students that you may or may not be thinking of. With online accessibility, any equation is rendered as an image, which can cause a whole series of issues. This means that if you have a student that has vision impairment, their screen reader, so the extension in Google Chrome that I mentioned on the slide, will not read the equation. It skips directly over it. So it'll read all the words in the word problem, but it'll skip directly over the equation. Um, unless someone has alt texted it, and that is something we have to actually go in and do in the actual coding of the web page or in the actual coding of the worksheet if the worksheet's online. Um, and then for everybody, that means that sometimes the images don't load if they don't have an updated browser, if they don't have an updated software. Um, you may have a Microsoft Word that you send a student, and if they don't have the same version of the equation editor, they won't be able to see them. Um, so a couple of things we can do for this is we can make sure we save things as PDFs. That's going to help with the equations loading. Um, we need to let students know that even if it is a PDF, you may have to wait to download it because the file is going to be a bigger size, so they can't immediately pop it open. If they're going to a web page, sometimes they need to wait an extra minute or two for those equations to populate. We need to let them know if you don't see equations, they need to contact you so you can work with them on getting those equations. Um, and some of the Chrome extensions, like the screen reader um, application, may not work. So. What are some things we can do to mitigate this and make things accessible? So there is an app called Fireshot. You can install it in Google Chrome for free, and it will actually turn any web page into a PDF. 
So if you're concerned that you have students that have slower internet that might not be able to load those equations, if you're concerned they don't have flash because a lot of equations are coded to flash, you can use Fireshot to actually take the image of the web page and turn it into a PDF so that you know all of your students can see it. I'm going to post a companion video to this lecture that shows you how to do that. So, so some things with Zoom. When we're holding Zoom sessions, you've heard me talk about that online has some different best practices. We don't actually use video when we're teaching because of bandwidth issues, because of privacy issues, because any student could take a picture on their phone of your class in grid view, and that is a privacy violation. Um, and a student could take a snapshot of a student and post it on social media with a bullying thing. So the video is actually um, very tricky, but when we're talking about accessibility, what's even more difficult is Zoom does not have closed captions. And you may have a student who speaks English as a second language, who doesn't have good hearing, but is good in the classroom because they sit in the front row. So maybe they haven't told you or haven't disclosed that they have some hearing issues. And when you're on Zoom, you're not able to have subtitles or captions for those students, which can cause issues. Um, that a struggling student that's struggling, maybe they're struggling to hear you in the classroom and that's why they sit closer to the front. They might be even leaning forward in their desk. They may not even realize they have some hearing issues. Um, there are some options to mitigate this. So I don't know how many of you are using Google Hangouts, but Google Hangouts does have a live captioning capability. So if you are making a recording, you can do it in Google Hangouts. You can take a screen recording of you in your own Google Hangout meeting with yourself, and it will caption it for you. You can also use YouTube. YouTube does have a closed captioning function. It automatically does all videos. It takes a couple of hours after you upload the video for it to fully do, but um, it is there. They're not perfect. Um, I think that it's pretty on par with Google Hangouts Live version, but with math, you may find there's a couple of tweaks, but it's better than nothing. And it's not gonna cost you a huge amount of time. So when we're talking about accessibility online, you might wanna consider, do you maybe have a kid that has a processing issue? Even if they're gifted, they may have a processing issue and those subtitles would really help them. Um, so what are you doing for accessibility right now with the changes in there? Or are you doing extension assignments? Are you maybe taking your weekly packet? I'm not sure how things are structured for you guys because every district is doing different things. So maybe in your weekly packet, you're including like a challenge page where you're offering something to those higher level kids. It's optional, but that's a great extension. Are you maybe giving um, a resource of how they're gonna use something in the real world? So that could be an extension for your students who are interested to go forward and look at it. Are you doing anything that's gonna address different needs of different learners? So that's what we're looking for some examples of. Um, when you can, back it up with a success story or share something you thought would work but didn't because we all learn through trying. And if you remember your first year in the classroom, you go in with all these fantastic ideas and sometimes they just don't work for the students that you have because the students you have are different every single year. So different strategies are gonna work, but we wanna make this a week where we're all sharing, here's what I've done in the past, especially in math, because sometimes in math it can be more challenging to think of these things, whereas English, you know, you've got a wide variety of things you can pull in, you've got vastly more resources you can pull in. Um, math is a little bit different. Um, also, as you're looking at your curriculums this week, Consider if the curriculum has extensions. A lot of times they do. Um, a lot of curriculums will have a project at the end of the chapter that's a hands-on project that's an extension of learning that is really great for your higher learners and you can give it as an alternate assessment. So that's really, really useful. Um, these are two resources I've provided for a little more information on online accessibility. As I said, that's something that I, it's in my main field of consulting. Um, is in online accessibility. So these two websites can give you a really nice look at this. This is also a very quickly growing field that educators are going into as side work. So if you are considering what do I want to do after I get my master's degree in education, this is a huge field. They're hiring math teachers to create alt text because of things like a matrix. So if we just 
make the matrix a direct conversion of a matrix. So we say row one, three, or open bracket, row, open bracket, two, three, five, six, seven. You need a math teacher to say, hey, it needs to say row one. It needs to say row one, column one, row two, column two, row two, column three. So that's a huge field that's growing. So I just wanted to give you a glimpse at it and maybe take a look and see if it is something you might be interested in. And it might be something you want to do either on the side or maybe you want to go into it full time. So there's just some great resources on those two web pages. I will be posting the follow up video on Fireshot. So make sure you check that out because that might be really useful for you right now.